Welcome everyone to Easter worship. I'm Pastor Jeremy and I'm glad to be worshiping with you. I want to invite you as we begin to respond to the famous Easter acclamation with me. I'm going to say Christ is risen and then you will respond Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Ready? Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. As I always like to say, I urge us in these times to continue living John Wesley's general rules for his Methodist societies. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Or as I like to say, don't COVID your neighbor. Now, grab your family, your coffee, a Bible if you desire, and a candle if you would like to light it along with me in a little while and let us worship God together. I'd like to begin with prayer. Resurrecting God, you conquered death and opened the gates of life everlasting. In the power of the Holy Spirit, raise us with Christ, that we too may proclaim healing and peace to the nations. Amen. Now let's join Jill and Mary as we sing together, Christ the Lord is risen today. There is an ancient tradition of using light to signify Christ's presence and resurrection with us. Lighting a new fire or candle on Easter, the Paschal candle. I don't have our official one, but I would like to light a candle with you now. And if you would like to do the same, you can pause me now and go get a candle to light. Now, let's celebrate the light of Christ. On this most holy morning, on which Jesus Christ passed over from death to life, we celebrate Christ's victory. The light of Christ rises in glory, overcoming sin and death. Christ is our light. Amen.
Now we will sing or listen to Easter Alleluia, new words to an old tune, with the gospel reading in between, read by Lori. Hi, I'm Lori. Today's gospel reading is from Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise to the living word. Worst ending ever. No, really. The resurrection story in the Gospel of Mark has the worst ending ever. And pretty much all scholars agree that the Gospel of Mark itself ended where today's reading ended. It's a bad ending, and people tried to fix it. I can just see a second or fourth century monk sitting at a desk, a scribe copying the ancient manuscripts of the Bible saying, Oh, 
That's bad. I can fix that ending. Centuries after the Gospel of Mark was finished, a shorter ending and a longer ending were added. Most Bibles have both endings for comparison. If you have a Bible handy, you can see if yours has them, or pause me if you want to check. Open it to the last chapter in Mark, and you'll likely see the shorter ending of Mark and the longer ending of Mark. The longer ending was probably added first, sometime during the second century. It includes a variety of appearance narratives like the other Gospels do. And it also provides a reference about believers picking up snakes in their hands, which is the basis for snake handling churches in Appalachia. The shorter ending was probably added later, sometime during the 4th century. It's a brief account of the women's sharing of the good news. In my big New Revised Standard Version Study Bible, there are notes written by the translators as a footnote, which, while slightly obtuse, say that the earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark stop after verse 8. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So it really does seem to be the worst ending ever. Now let's think about this. The story starts out like normal. The women go to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. They find the stone rolled away and see a young man dressed in white. He tells them, do not be alarmed and all that. He has been raised. He is not here. And then tells them to go tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus is going ahead to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. On most of this, the other Gospels agree with Mark, with some variation in details. But then we find out that the women got scared and fled in Mark. Not only are they not comforted by the young man in white, but they run away and keep their mouths shut, instead of telling the disciples like they were instructed. The Gospel of Mark ends with the failure of Jesus' closest friends to share the good news. Worst ending ever. But what if it's not? What if it's the best ending ever? All right, so the women seem to fail Jesus at the end. To their great credit, they had the courage to stick with him that far. There's no mention of the other disciples at or after Jesus's crucifixion. Judas betrayed him, Peter denied him, so all his disciples in the end failed him. But if the women fled, there is an important question that begins to nag at us. Who else witnessed the resurrection? There had to be someone. If nobody else witnessed the resurrection, it stops the movement dead in its tracks. If nobody else witnessed the empty tomb, the angel's message, who passed on the good news? I contend that there is another witness, and I'm not just talking about the messenger and God. Actually, this person witnessed everything from the very beginning of Jesus's ministry. His miracles, his healings, his casting out of demons, his teachings, his predictions of his passion and death, and the events themselves. And now, this very person has witnessed the empty tomb and been given the commission to go tell the good news. Do you know who this person is? It's you. And me and all of the readers of Mark's gospel throughout the centuries. Instead of forgetting an ending, maybe instead the author of Mark is brilliant. Rather than simply overhearing what happens, the ending is such that we need to enter the story. We are given urgency because Jesus' disciples don't complete the task. We are the ones who have witnessed the resurrection. We must pick up where Jesus' disciples at the tomb left off best ending ever. When we look at it this way, we realize that we are a part of the story, the ongoing story, centuries of good news. When the author of Mark ended the gospel this way, he put the responsibility for the transmission of the Easter message squarely on our shoulders. We have the opportunity and the challenge to spread the good news. 
the good news that God's grace is able to redeem bad endings. That even when there is brokenness, when we are at our lowest low, personally and societally, God is still with us and may even do something amazing. The good news that in the face of betrayal, abandonment, violence, death, and failure, God's grace wins the day. And the good news that this story continues in our own lives. So, best ending ever. When the world seems to have had its share of good and bad endings in the past year, seemingly many more bad than good, we are comforted with the grace that redeems bad endings and invites us to share the good news, to serve other people as Jesus served, to love other people as Jesus loved, to let all that you do reflect God's grace, the grace that triumphs this day. Because even as we talk about the best ending ever, we must admit that it is actually only the beginning. And we are the people who are responsible for sharing the good news of the Easter message. In that sense, it's really the best beginning ever. And all God's people said, Amen. And now let us continue in a time of prayer. I invite us to take a few deep breaths before we pray and call to mind people and situations about which you would like to pray during a time of silence. Here are some suggestions as we think about the time in which we live, or I invite you to pause me and pull up the prayer list from the weekly email to pray for persons in our church community. We pray for people who have died, people infected with the virus, people at high risk of infection, hospitals, doctors, nurses, and staff, first responders, mental health professionals, and those struggling with mental health issues, people working in the midst of the pandemic and people out of work because of it, people working for systemic change toward justice and peace, teachers and students doing school in many different forms, at all educational levels, as well as people in support or administrative roles in school, leaders in our nation and world, scientists, journalists, parents, and their children. As we breathe, pray for these people, and I will close us with a prayer from the Iona community. Breathe in. And out. Breathe in. And out. Breathe in. And out. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, we greet you. Your hands still have holes in them, your feet are wet from the dew, and with the memory of our names, undimmed by three days of death, you meet us, risen from the grave. We fail to understand how, we puzzle at the reason why. But you have come not to answer our questions, but to show us your face. You are alive, and the world can rejoice again. Hallelujah. Amen. And now let us pray for the coming of God's kingdom in the words Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now let's join Jill and Mary as we sing or listen to Crown Him with Many Crowns.
Thank you for worshiping with me. Speaking of best endings ever, stay tuned after the benediction for the 2021 United Methodist Virtual Choir singing Thine Be the Glory. It's a little Easter egg for those who watch all the way to the end. Next Sunday, we will continue to worship on YouTube with a very special service of confirmation. Be sure to join us in celebration of the journey of these youth in their lives of faith. As we continue in spring with the virus still at high levels, please do all the things that have been working to keep the virus at bay. Stay home and stay safe, wear a well-fitting mask or two, wash your hands and practice physical distancing from others. I also encourage you to get vaccinated as you are eligible, if you are willing and able. All of this to me seems to be a great way to show love for your neighbor. Please continue to check your email for updates from Christy, or if you're tuning in for the first time, check us out on Facebook or our website, newrichmondwiumc.org. And now may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May God look on you with favor and give you peace. Be well. Amen. <laughs>